All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Paul Gordon. I am the American Spaces Director at the U.S. Embassy in Zambia, and we're very pleased to bring you a special documentary screening and a film discussion afterwards in honor of Juneteenth. And I'll go ahead and just get started by introducing our uh, host for today, and uh, he'll lead our discussion following the film. Uh, it's Sean McIntosh. He is the Public Affairs Director for the U.S. Embassy, and he's going to go ahead and just introduce the film for everyone, and then we'll go ahead and start the movie. Thank you, everyone. Go ahead, Sean. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. So greetings to all my friends there in Zambia, You're presently in the United States. No thanks to COVID. Looking forward to coming back, resuming my mission there and seeing many of our friends again. And so, yeah, today is June 19th. So on June 19th, 1865, the uh, Major General from the Union Army of the United States came down to Texas and notified slaves in that state that they were free. So this was about two years after that President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which was mostly effectively liberate all slaves in the Confederate States. So for those of you who don't know too much about US Civil War history, it was a war between the North and the South, the North representing the Union, the South being the Confederacy. And as you can see, I am an African-American diplomat. So many years ago, yeah, this way, yeah, over probably 50, 60, 100 years ago, you probably wouldn't even see my face in the American, American Diplomatic Corps. And so I just wanted to show everyone my Juneteenth shirt we get that up, celebrating today. And so what we're going to do is have everyone take a look at this 20-minute film, quick 20-minute film, and then we'll discuss it. I see that some people have already sent some questions in advance, and obviously this screening, this event is quite apropos in the wake of the George Floyd killing along with the protests that have ensued in that aftermath. So looking forward to having a conversation to bring everything into context and looking forward to enjoying your questions. And so this documentary is brought to you by the Texas, the Texas Institute for the Preservation of History and Culture. And it is called Juneteenth, a Celebration of Freedom. And so with that, Paul, you can cue up the reel. Thank you. Of lots of stuff to think about. And so what I would like to do is frame our discussion a bit around four points or themes. And I can't take 100% credit for this. So I want to give credit to Cassandra Dillard of Teaching Tolerance, who has actually kind of set this up nicely. But when, I guess when you think about contributing to the discussion or asking your questions, let's think about it in these four realms. So looking at Juneteenth, looking at Juneteenth, oh gosh, Juneteenth, in terms of look, examining culture as resistance. Secondly, understanding emancipation. Third, looking at what a backlash to freedom means. And finally, fourth, trying to focus on American ideals. So. I'll begin with the, the notion of the cultural resistance. So throughout African-American history, I mean, there have been a lot of unfortunate events that have harmed us, harmed our legacies, but yet African-Americans tend to find something deep within to celebrate that historical moment in order to overcome, to achieve social, political, or economic relative equality. And so even though at that time and even times today, African-Americans continue to face threats of continued oppression, violence, and death. Even when you look at June, June to, Juneteenth, a year after they learn of their, uh, of their freedom, formerly enslaved people resiliently, resiliently rallied around June 19th 
and made the celebration an annual ritual. So you can see from the film how the holiday spread to other states. So officially, 40 states and the District of Columbia recognized June to, Juneteenth, I'm stumbling on that word, but <laughs> recognized Juneteenth as a holiday in each of the states. It's not yet a national holiday of the United States, but many states do already recognize it. And as a matter of fact, in light of some recent events, a couple of states, one being in particular New York, has given state government officials uh, the day off paid in commemoration of Juneteenth. If we look at understanding emancipation, so what goes on, which is kind of flawed, if you are an American learning US history, the simplified version is that people, we, we get educated that President Lincoln freed the slaves. That is a bit inaccurate. President Lincoln's goal in the Civil War was to preserve the Union. And I, I, I gotta give credit to my eighth grade social studies teacher, Mrs. Jokes, because she, she made sure that was ingrained in us. His goal was to preserve the Union. Not that he didn't care about slavery, but his goal was uniting the North and South. And so even after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, you'll notice from the video that there were still enslaved people. States like Texas decided to defy those orders and either not tell people that they were free or just outwardly defy it and say, no, you are still going to work for us. And so it actually wasn't until December 6th, December 6th 1865, that the United States Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which officially abolished slavery. But as history will tell you, there were still other discriminatory practices that did not quite provide African Americans their freedom. Thirdly, if we look at Juneteenth in terms of a kind of a backlash to freedom, it is quite the interesting thing that, um, excuse me, that in looking at Juneteenth, they, there are a lot of untold stories. And let me just give you one second to consult my notes. Um, there is, with the acceptance of freedom, there's always another battle for African-Americans to fight. And if anything from recent events in the United States shows, there's still a struggle for freedom. And not just talking about freedom from enslavement, but freedom in terms of social, political, and economic equality. And the last thing, we wanna focus on American ideals. Isn't it ironic that less than a month from today is America's Independence Day, July 4th, July 4th, 1776. But from July 4th, 1776 to the Civil War and Juneteenth, it's 89 years that African Americans still weren't independent on their own. And if you look at the founding charter of the United States, it classified slaves, African Americans, as three fifths of a person. So even in our founding history, Black people were officially not even equal to the white counterparts. I think I will stop there. I, I could always add a little more. I know people have questions. So what I'll do is I will allow someone to ask a question and then I'll go to some questions submitted previously. So I will stop now and feel free to submit a question in the chat or even speak up. Show your video. This is a conversation. Show your video and, and let's talk. Thank you. That we received earlier. So this is kind of putting it into the current context, and this is a very good question. So why is there still racial profiling in the United States as seen in news? And there are a number of ways we can answer this question. And so if you want to connect this back to slavery and Juneteenth, June, Juneteenth, those are the foundations of what we call systematic racism in the United States. So when something is systematic, it's something that's built over 
a period of time that gets institutionalized and becomes very difficult to change, even if a person who is acting out of proper responsibility has kind of no intent to be that racist. It's just something that becomes buried in the subconscious. So in the United States, this, as the George Floyd incidents, incident, as well as other incidents show, racism is still a systematic issue in the United States, something that is a indelible stain in the, in the history and something that we are trying to deal with collectively as a country. The other thing that I think you need to understand is that they're accompanied with systematic racism. There's a historical prejudice. If you look at the rate of incarceration of African Americans in the United States, it is disproportionately higher to other races, including white Americans. And so if you are a police officer in the United States and you pull over a black male, black female, black person driving a vehicle or just happen to interact with a black male, you have this historical prejudice in that you are you are seeing that high incarceration rate, which translates in to your mind that a black person is likely to commit a crime. And even if you look at the incarceration rate, there are some arguments, some there are some people that believe that there's obviously systematic racism in there where possibly there are some false com false convictions that have skewed that incarceration rate. Uh, and then the, the last point I'll say to address the racial profiling is that there, what contributes to that is a lack of a relationship between the police and the communities for which they serve. So in the United States, unlike Zambia, we have localized police. There's not just national police, but also localized police. It can go by county, it can go by town, it can go by state, and then all the way up to the national level. And so there have been, I mean, there have been reports that where a non-existing relationship or a bad relationship between the police force and the community they serve is present, that will have an impact on the type of profiling in a negative manner. Uh, and I'll stop there. I can go into more details to give some examples, but Juan, Paul, why don't you ask? Uh, it's, it's, we questions. have two live participants, so I'm gonna unmute uh, Labusi. Lebosi, uh, to ask a question. Go ahead. Okay, yes. So uh, my question is, why why has it taken so long for Juneteenth to be a national holiday? Uh, that's the first question. And I think uh, from Sean's explanation, it seems to, I, I can get the, the common thread uh, being racism, you know, like racism kind, uh, kind of informing slavery then uh, when you look at the present and the George Floyd, you know, issue, uh, it's like there's racism, you know, which is at the bottom of it. So my question is, uh, how robust is uh, the education system in America in terms of changing whatever we're seeing, you know? So if we're talking about the futures of education or what, what the future of education uh, should be as far as uh, bringing the ideal world that we want to see. Uh, is, is the current education system enough? And if it's not enough, what's the ideal kind of education we need? Because I'm thinking that education would be, you know, the fundamental tool needed to be able to see uh, the society that we need. So what's the ideal uh, education system uh, that should be provided to bring about the, the profound change that everybody wants to see? Thank you. Fantastic question, Lubosi. So to answer your first question, it is all dependent or predicated on a matter of political will. So we are a nation of laws. The uh, U.S. Congress has to pass a bill, pass the bill that, the president, that the president would sign into law to recognize Juneteenth as a national holiday. Now for on June 15th, or rather the third Monday in January is a uh, federal holiday dedicated to the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That took some time to pass into law. If you want to go back to the history uh, with, you know, between the, the liberal and the conservative 
legislators on that. I mean, there everybody was not on board in honoring Dr. King in that regard. So basically, there has to be a democratic process that comes into play whereby bill sponsors come up and introduce a piece of legislation, try to curry favor on both sides of the aisle, get the president on board to sign and make that a national holiday. You know, fortunately, we have seen in 40 states in Washington, D.C., where that process has actually taken place, uh, but it has not yet taken place at the national level. If you look at current news in the United States, there's actually some renewed momentum, obviously based on some of the recent events to get Juneteenth to be considered more seriously at the national level. But the bottom line is that we are a nation of laws and the legislators have to put forth a bill and the president has to sign in order for that to become a national holiday. And that has not happened yet. To answer your second question about the education system in the United States, this has been a discussion that I know has gone on much of my life as a student and even long after I've graduated from school. I mentioned my social studies teacher, my eighth grade social studies teacher. We, we talked about this the other day. And, you know, unfortunately, in the U.S. system, the totality of American history is not exactly reflected in many classrooms or, uh, around the nation. One point of progress that we do have in African American History Month, in the month of February, where schools uh, dedicate that month to teaching and learning about African American history. There's always the argument that Black history is more than just one month. It needs to be celebrated all throughout the year, but there, the onus is on our state education systems. And again, you know, when we're looking at the United States, the United States is a decentralized system. So unlike Zambia, which is very centralized, in the United States, states have the power to implement educational curriculum. And again, if you, were to, if you want to connect this to my first question about there being a political will, about there being institutionals and institutions that want to make this reality, it is all a matter of those leaders enacting this into state law. Next question. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Justina to ask a question. Hi. Hello. Can you get me? Gotcha. Okay. My question, um, you said America got in, its independence on the 4th of July, 17 something, somewhere there. Um, what exactly or who did America get independence from? Because even after independence, 89 years on, there was still slavery. What, what sort of independence was that? Because I feel like the real independence should have been the Juneteenth one when everyone was free. So what exactly did America get its independence from? So let me ask you this, who did Zambia get its independence from? From the British colonials. All right, that's your answer. That's one, or rather, I wouldn't say, I mean, the United States fought for its independence, it basically grabbed its independence away from Britain. Britain did not willfully give it up, there was a war. For this. So the United States grabbed, claimed its independence from Great Britain, from the United Kingdom. And then some would even say that we had to fight, the United States had to fight a second war for independence in 1812. We had to fight the British again. The British burned down our White House and we had to win another war to preserve our union. But again, you, you point out something in your belief that the real independence is Juneteenth. And I think that traces back to one of to the American ideals theme in that, yes, there was freedom for the oppressed, but not yet freedom for, sorry, there was freedom, there was not freedom for the oppressed, but there was freedom for the oppressors. So it took 89 years from the War of Independence to the end of the Civil War for African Americans to, to get some sort of semblance of freedom. Now, you take that a century later, if you examine the history of the segregated South, the United States, there, we're African Americans 
was still fighting for their freedom, fighting for freedom to vote, freedom to 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 claim land titles, all the socio political and economic notions or, or institutions that, if you look in our if you look at our constitution, our right to private property, it, we were still still fighting for it. So the war or the the quest for absolute freedom continues for African Americans. Okay, I'm going to go to a question that we received earlier, and then we can go back to the rest of the audience. So, so another great question. Someone asked, "What uh, have there been internal discussions, or have there been discussions?" at the US Embassy in light of the George Floyd situation. And yes, yes, they have been. And I want to admire and appreciate our Charge d'Affaires, David Young for really taking that on. It's a quite a very difficult conversation to have because it is a conversation about a serious and uncomfortable issue in the United States and some people beg the question, what makes us so different in light of prior episodes? And if I would say that it's the COVID-19 has really brought things out because underlying the racial issue that's going on in the United States, there are socio-political and economic disparities that have been brought to light, especially by COVID-19. You will see news reports that African Americans have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and you know due to disparities in the health insurance world that's another effect on, on African Americans so a lot of this stuff is being brought out to light but getting back to the conversations that we've had in the embassy we, we, we've, we've had several because we recognize this is a painful part of our history that we need to face and as a country that is supposed to be the leading democracy of the free world, we recognize we can, we can be better. We need to be on the right side of history. And we recognize that nations like Zambia are looking at us and asking us what is going on. If America cannot handle its domestic situations, what gives the United States the right to tell Zambia or any other nation that it has a corruption or human rights problem? We have heard that loud and clear, and we honestly believe that with we've made a lot of progress in, in the United States, and we want to continue to live up to that standard. Any other questions from the audience? I think there's one from another Sean. Oh, okay, I think I know this guy. <laughs> Good morning, Sean. Good morning, everyone. Um, my question is, given, given your understanding of history, what do you feel um, this time around, what, um, what are realistic reforms that you think we will be able to achieve um, and sustain this time around? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's a, that is a fantastic question. And Sean and Sanjay, I'm sure you, you're paying attention to the news. People are taking some quick action. You, you see major companies like Netflix pledging millions of dollars to support historically black colleges and universities, namely Morehouse and Spelman, and donate to the United Negro College Fund. You've had the, I, forget the, I don't know if it's a holding company, is Procter & Gamble the holding company of Aunt Jemima? Uh, whoever's the manufacturer of Aunt Jemima has decided that Aunt Jemima will no longer be Aunt Jemima. It'll be rebranded as, as something else. And for the Zambians in, in the audience, Jemima yeah. is a very stereotypical figure of the African female that has been allowed to thrive for many, many years and something that is that is long overdue. What we are seeing in the United States is that many people are finally awake, finally having an awakening to this situation, partly as I alluded to, probably the COVID-19, because that is literally that has literally put the United States as a standstill. So people now have the time to really examine what is going on in their backyard. People are looking at the types of relationships that are existing between ethnicities. And so 
going ahead, I, I, I'm hopeful that, as I told you about the underlying factors and economic disparities, political disparities, social disparities, those are some of the things that can be corrected in, in the near term. I'm not sure about 100%, but if recent events in the last two weeks are any indicator, I mean, this is the fastest that I've that in my life I've ever seen uh, something happening like this. And it, it, the interesting part is that this is touching all sectors of society in the United States, sports, entertainment, politics, commercial, commerce. And it's just, it, it's, it's quite an interesting time to be living and to see what is, is happening. Okay, sorry, there's one other, one other question. Should we always carry the memories of black enslavement? And if so, why is it important that we don't forget? I would say that's a personal choice up to everyone in this conversation and, and, and around the world. A as an African American, I'm going to say that absolutely, it's a, it's a part of my identity. It's something I reflect on every day. You know, being a minority in my profession, I, I, I see it all the time. If you look you know, around the world, there aren't too many African American ambassadors these days, about two to three African American ambassadors. And that's something that, that needs to change. That's it, Within the State Department and representing the US government, we always talk about representing America, representing the diversity of America. And that really is pinned down to representing the diversity of identities. Their diversity, you can define it in, 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 in any term, but when a non-American sees me as a diplomat working in his or her country, I want that person to one recognize that I am a US diplomat on equal ground with my other non-African-American counterparts to, for, to forge forward our policies and and make a way for forging programs of mutual interest. Uh, I think uh, Nisa, you are unmuted. Yeah. Go on. Hi. Hello. Awesome. So you can hear me. Um, thank you so much for this. I've been following everything uh, you've been sharing, and I think it's very clear to, to note that a lot of people all over the world are interested in America, and perhaps we're all trying to understand why the situation is the way it is. And so um, you've been able to share a lot from that. Uh, just two comments I had. Firstly, you mentioned we have to get on the right side of history, and I just felt as though that really depends on the education system and what is included in the curriculum. Because um, at the beginning of the documentary we watched, uh, there was a comment as to how the celebration for June 10th started as a result of, be it uh, Black Americans trying to remember or remind themselves uh, what happened uh, before what their lives were like before freedom and things like that. And so when we see that stop happening, it's a question of what do you become when you forget who you are and where you come from? So I feel like it will always get back to the education and just not formal education, but it's not yes. what they learn in school or university, but also what people are told in their homes. So that's also very important. And I just wanted to make a comment on that. Uh, uh, asked a question in regards to education system. But while you were speaking, I'm recently getting uncomfortable with the word African American. And I feel as though there might be a problem in that. Why can't you just be American? So that's the first question. Why can't especially it's 2020, why can't you just be American? You were born there, you were raised there, education, and you're also serving. So why can't you just be an American? Um, and also, did I forget my question? Okay, yeah, so here's another one. I, I don't know how you take this, but could there be a chance that America in general just spends so much time solving other people's problems and not really concentrating on their own problems at home? 
So those two questions. Thanks and thank you for the session. All right, Nisa, great question. So to address the African-American question, the United States has always been referred to as a melting pot and meaning that we are a country filled with identities. I mean, it, I, I, identity is a big thing in the United States. And it, to get a little bit deeper, these identities trace to benefits from certain entitled programs as well, which is the need to have these bifurcation of different ethnicities. And so I feel that many Americans of the African persuasion, or why not put it that way, really like to honor their history in being identified as African American. I mean, there's there's no disputable or evidence that we don't come from Africa. So if you look at the history of the uh, of the slave of the slave trade, which started in Angola and stretched from other parts of West Africa, black people Africans were brought to you know, Brazil, the Caribbean, other parts of the Western Hemisphere, and then in, into America and from there, subsequent generations came about. You know, my name is my name is Sean McIntosh. That's not quite a African name. It's a Scottish Irish name, but that just shows the legacy of slavery and how I came into this world. If you were to trace my lineage, my immediate lineage, on my mother's side of the family, this is a heritage from Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago was a destination for many slaves from Africa. And then on my father's side from the deep South, South Carolina, where, you know, in, in the South, we talked about the Civil War, the bastion of the Confederacy, slaves worked the, the plantations there. So that's kind of where, that's where my history comes from. But I think it's a, it's a point of pride for, for African Americans. And, and, and I do note that when Africans come to the States, there, there's that argument that, that goes, that goes on there. But if you also got to take a look at how our ethnicity, our, our identification has evolved. I mean, first we were called slaves, then we were called the N-word, we were called niggers, very offensive. Then we were called Negroes, then we were called black, and now black African-American is the politically accepted word. But I think African-Americans take great pride in their linkages back to the continent. Uh, your second question, can you repeat it? Because I, I, I have forgotten it. Okay, thank you for answering that. Uh, so my second question, I was just trying to find out, could it be that America is spending so much time solving other people's problems, other countries' problems, and not really paying attention to what's going on at home? So Niza, you have hit at a foundational principle in U.S. history. So George Washington, our first president, after, as he was leaving office, he cautioned the United States from getting involved in other countries' affairs. I mean, there, our, our principal foreign policy was one of isolationism in the beginning years of, of our republic. Now, as the United States started to expand, started to become stronger, started to acquire other territories, started to become an economic powerhouse, there was, I mean, it, it was very hard to resist uh, no longer being isolationist. I mean, it, just look at the word, we're, we're all interdependent. And there is the belief that America, the United States of America being the leading economy in the world has a responsibility to help out its fellow man. Now, I mean, our budget is limited, so it's, and, and then, you know, interests in one nation are a little bit different from others, but that's kind of how, if you want to, I'm, I'm addressing it from an academic standpoint. So that, that, that's how that started. It's because of our ability to evolve is how we are getting involved in international affairs. And, and it's not just us, now they're in international bodies like the United Nations, International Monetary Fund, World Bank that all realize we are an inter interdependent world.
think the last question, and then we'll we'll go ahead and close, is from uh, Sean. Go ahead and hand one more question. Okay, thank you, um, Sean. This is just a follow up to what I had asked before, and you mentioned um, big corporations such as Procter and Gamble, and you mentioned um, how the Aunt Jemima's logo is changing as far as some of the change that so that we'll see or can have seen in, in this round of um, demonstrations. My, my question is, how do you, how do you view that um, from a social standpoint where just because companies are now showing support publicly, that doesn't necessarily mean that they, that the people behind the corporation have necessarily changed their mind about social and racial issues. They've just realized that public opinion is has now shifted so that they need to be of this certain opinion to make sure that they keep um, bringing in dollars. Because if people have realized, well, if this company is going to continue with racist practices, I'm no longer going to buy products from from this company. How how do we get past the facade of of change or and get to real change where the people behind the companies are actually looking at their practice and say, hey, we actually have had very problematic practices and we need to change the culture within our corporation, not just the public statement yeah. or the public appearance of our corporation. That's a, a fantastic question. And I'll begin with saying, I can't necessarily speak to what's inside people's hearts. And so what we really have to do is look at actions. And, and that's what African men, African Americans have been demanding for all, all this time. You know, when a uh, situation happens, you know, there'll be a sympathetic message without any action. And so the notion that there is now some concrete action gives some people a little bit of hope. Now, what needs to happen following that is a sustainable course of action to keep that going. It's not enough for corporations to throw money to a problem without actually being kind of embedded with the issue. If you're going to support something wholeheartedly, you actually got to be in there in the grassroots to really understand the problem that African Americans or other minorities face to, to move forward. And what this moment in time has taught us or has pushed many people to do is have these uncomfortable conversations. That is really what's happening. I mean, uncomfortable on both sides. Uh, Many African Americans feel like there is not a need, or feel that they should not have have the burden to educate people upon race, educate non African Americans on race. But those people should go out and get some books and do that. And then on the other side, the non African Americans are afraid to offend the African Americans. So it is a matter of getting out of those two comfort zones and coming together and and and, and just talking. And I would just say that from a little bit, this was kind of the goal with our discussions with the embassy about this, to really get people out of their comfort zone to address some of the experiences that people know of or have personally been involved in and to get a better understanding of, we, of who we are as humans. I mean, this is a human being issue. It's a human interest issue and we need to recognize that for the sake of humanity, that within corporate America, I mean, there, there needs to be changes like in I guess, diversity hiring or in HR, but even beyond that, that's what I, you know, I, I've seen in many companies in the past that they would hire diversity officers or make a diversity officer. And that would be the ceiling for an African-American to get as far as C-suite goals. And what we need to recognize is getting beyond that. The African Americans want to be leaders in Fortune 500 companies. We want to get into the seats. We want, to, we want to see more of that. And in order to get beyond that, we need to chip away at this systemic racism, systemic prejudice, and introduce other factors that can ameliorate that. All right, Sean, if there's no more questions, do you want to go ahead and uh, give any uh, closing remarks? And uh, then we'll go ahead and, and finish up. All right, certainly I will. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope it was educational. Hope everyone learned something. 
again, I'm going to promo my shirt. This is a Juneteenth shirt. So we just want to promo that. Very proud to be African-American. I know my country needs to do more, but I'm very happy to represent it at this time where the hard questions are coming up. Keep on asking us the hard questions. They, they need to be answered. And as an African-American, I am very privileged, I'm very honored to come back to the continent, to the motherland, as we call it. I previously served in Nigeria, and this is my second tour on the continent in Zambia. And my, my previous job prior to coming to Zambia, I was the Zimbabwe policy officer back in Washington, D.C. So I have three African nations kind of in my portfolio that I think I'm attuned. And it's, it's, it's been my honor to do this. I, many of you have seen the several U.S. Embassy statements on the George Floyd situation. Again, we deplore what's happened. The, we deplore the tragic killing. And we note that the U.S. Department of Justice has undertaken an investigation into the circumstances surrounding George, George Floyd's death. And one officer has already been charged with murder. The other two officers, or the other officers are being charged with aiding and abetting that. And so uh, it, you know, it, it's something that we're looking at. We know our law enforcement is not perfect, but at the same time, we realize that law enforcement is there to protect the, to honor the security of the people that it serves. And we wanna make sure that happens, whether in the United States or abroad. So everyone continue to follow our Facebook page, our Twitter page, our embassy website, our charge of affairs. David Young continues to go out into the media on radio. He was on, he was on ZNBC yesterday. I, I wanna put in a plug that I think tomorrow at 10 o'clock AM, yes, tomorrow at 10 o'clock AM, ZNBC will air the quest for equality an interview, an exclusive interview with Charge d'Affaires, David Young, talking about the George Floyd situation and what this means for America's role as a democracy in this world. I think I've spoken for long enough. I thank you all for your time. And we will get some highlights of this talk up on Facebook. So for those of your friends who weren't unable to join us, let them know that something's coming out and to stay tuned. Thank you all very much.